The ability to select objects in a 3D scene using the mouse is obviously very useful in many types of games. With minor modifications we can use the same technique to select individual triangles and even vertices. In this video we're going to learn how to do it. By the way the clicking sounds were added in post-production and are not part of OpenGL. Just saying. Ok guys, in order to implement this technique we're going to use a capability of OpenGL called Render to Texture. This feature is available in pretty much all the rendering APIs and it's actually a very important building block in many techniques such as shadow mapping and deferred rendering. So this is a great opportunity to get to know Render to Texture and we will use it very often in the future. Up until this point our main render function was very simple. We always render into what is called a default frame buffer which is automatically created along with the window. So this is very user friendly and takes some burden away from us. The idea behind render to texture is that we can create additional frame buffers and render stuff into them. Stuff which is actually not going to be presented directly on the screen and instead will be used to drive various algorithms. We can even bind these frame buffers as a source for consecutive draw calls. In the case of selecting objects with the mouse it is very simple to get the location of the mouse cursor when we click a button. The challenge is identifying the triangle or object that the pixel that we clicked on belongs to. The solution is to use render to texture and instead of writing out the colors as usual, we can actually write pieces of information that will basically tell us everything that we need to know about all the pixels. We can then read back this frame buffer and access the specific pixel that corresponds to the location where we clicked on the mouse. We can now do anything we want with the pixel information such as render the selected object or triangle in a specific color. So the architecture is as follows. In the initialization phase we need to create a texture to store the pixel info. The info will be composed of the object index, the draw call index and the triangle index. Since all these indices are integers we will create an integer texture. All the textures we've been using so far have been floating points so an integer texture is quite refreshing. We are now ready to render. The main render function is going to be split into two phases. The first phase is called the picking phase. Picking is yet another name for this technique. In this phase we will bind the integer texture for writing and we will render the objects using a special type of fragment shader that writes out the pixel info. Luckily for us GLSL provides an internal index for the triangle so we don't need a special vertex buffer for it. The object and draw call indices will be provided as uniform variables. The second phase is the rendering phase. This is where we bind back the default frame buffer. We check if a mouse button was pressed and in that case we read the pixel information. This tells us the object, draw call and triangle that own the pixel. If the pixel is part of one of the objects and not the background we use a simple shader to render the specific triangle in a different color. So that's the theory. Now let's jump into the code and see how to implement it. Damn, I love this job. Let's begin with the manually created frame buffer. I've wrapped it with a class called Picking Texture. This class has three private variables that store the handles that we need. First, we have the handle of the frame buffer. You can think about the frame buffer as a thin meta object that provides access to a texture. The actual storage is allocated inside the texture and we need a frame buffer because we can actually render into multiple textures. The second handle is for the texture and the third one is for the depth buffer. Remember that objects in a 3D scene may overlap and when that happens we want to select the object that is closest to the camera. When we render into the default frame buffer this is taken care of by its depth buffer and the depth test but we are rendering into a manually created frame buffer so we must make sure to use our own depth buffer. When the picking phase is complete, the texture will contain the information of the closest pixels. The interface of the class is very simple. We have an initialization method using the dimensions of the screen. We also have a couple of methods to enable and disable writing into the texture. There is also a structure that holds the pixel info and a function that reads the pixel info at a specific coordinate. Let's see the implementation of this class. We start with the init function. We create a handle for the frame buffer using glgen frame buffers. This function is very similar to other creation functions that we are already familiar with. Next, we bind the frame buffer to the glframebuffer target. 
we can specifically bind the frame buffer for reading or writing, or when we use GL frame buffer, we bind it for both reading and writing. Next, we create a 2D texture handle. We bind it to the GL texture 2D target, and we allocate the actual storage using GL text image 2D. Notice that in order to make this an unsigned integer texture, we use GL RGB 32 UI as the internal format, GL RGB integer as the format, and GL unsigned int as the data type. Combining all these formats and types correctly in OpenGL can often be a pain, and I literally pulled the last few pieces of hair from my head trying to get this to work. But you don't have to, so we can continue. The next two calls set the min and mag filters to GL nearest. I'm not 100% sure that this is really needed, but I read a few people online that recommended it, so I've added it for now. The next call attaches the texture to the frame buffer, because right now they are two independent objects. The texture is now connected to the frame buffer on the first color attachment. When we render into multiple textures, we bind them to additional attachment points. We now need to create a depth buffer. This is a very similar procedure. Note that we use GL depth component for the two format parameters and GL float for the type. We also need to attach the depth texture to the depth attachment of the frame buffer. Before we start using the new frame buffer, it is recommended to check that everything is okay using GL check frame buffer status. This function performs a lot of checks on the frame buffer and returns the GL frame buffer complete if everything is okay and an error code otherwise. Before we leave the function, we disconnect the texture and bind back the default frame buffer. We'll review the remaining methods upon usage. Now let's jump into the main application code and notice that in this example I'm using GLFW exclusively. I've been getting comments about my usage of FreeGLAT and while I don't really see this as an important issue, I decided that if you can't beat them, join them. So you can see the GLFW initialization code in OGL dev glfw.cpp and it is pretty standard. Back to the application code and we can see that we have a simple private structure to store the coordinates of the mouse and an is pressed indicator. In the mouse callback function, we store the coordinates of the cursor if the left button was clicked and update the is pressed flag. Let's see the main render function. I actually optimized it a little bit by skipping the entire picking phase when the mouse button is not pressed. We start the picking phase by enabling writing into the manually created frame buffer. This simply means binding the frame buffer handle to the GL draw frame buffer target. This tells the driver that at this stage we plan to write and not read. Next, we clear the color and the depth buffers as usual. We enable the special picking shaders, which we will see in a second. For simplicity, we have a single mesh here and an array of positions so that we can render it at different locations. We loop over the array and render the objects one by one. For each object, we set its index into the shader, and notice that I'm actually using i plus 1. The reason is that the frame buffer is cleared to 0, so by doing this increment, we can differentiate between the pixels that belong to objects and those that are simply background. Notice that the render function takes the address of the picking technique object. This is because we want to update the uniform of the draw index in the shader for each draw call. The picking technique derives from the iRender callback's pure virtual interface, which contains a single function that must be called before each draw call. This interface helps us keep the mesh object and the technique separated. In the implementation of the virtual function, we simply push the draw index down to the shader. The vertex shader of the picking technique is very simple. We just need to transform the position of the vertex so the fragment shader will be executed for the same pixels as in the regular render phase. The fragment shader itself has two uniform variables for the object and draw indices. Notice that the type of the output variable is uvec3 for unsigned integer vector. We use the two uniforms to construct the output vector plus the system generated variable primitive id. The picking phase ends by disabling writing into the picking texture. This simply means binding back the default frame buffer. We can verify that the picking phase is working correctly by inspecting the picking texture in API Trace. As you can see, since this is an integer texture, API Trace can't reproduce it in color by default, but we can click the opaque checkbox and get a sense of how the texture looks like. We can check the pixel values on the bottom left hand corner and verify that they make sense.
Finally, we are at the render phase. If the left mouse button was pressed, we read a pixel from the picking texture at the cursor location. We have to flip the Y coordinate because in GLFW the 00, 0 coordinate is located at the top left corner, while in OpenGL textures it is located at the bottom left corner. In order to read from the frame buffer, we have to bind it to the GL read frame buffer target and set the source of the pixels to be the first color attachment. We use GL read pixels to fetch a single pixel from the specified location. We have to use GL RGB integer and GL unsigned int as the format and type. Before we leave, we clean up after ourselves. As we discussed earlier, the indices of the real object starts at 1, so we have to decrement to get it back to 0 base. We use the object index to get the position of the corresponding object from the position array. We enable the simple color effect, which, as its name suggests, writes out the red color. In order to draw only the selected primitive, we use a special draw function that takes the draw index and the primitive ID. This function uses the draw index to select the corresponding base index, as well as the primitive index, which must be multiplied by 3 as an offset into the array of indices. We draw three elements here for a single triangle. If you're not familiar with how I load and manage meshes, then check out my tutorial on loading meshes using SAMP. I'll put a link in the video description below. After we draw the triangle that we clicked on with a special color, we enable the regular lighting technique and render all the objects as usual. I've also added the feature of marking the entire selected object. To do that, there's a new uniform in the fragment shader which we simply multiply by the result of the lighting equation to get the final color. Back in the render phase, if the current object is the one that we clicked on, we set this uniform to a value which will reset the red and blue channels and leave out only the green. If this is any other object, we disable its effect by setting the uniform to all ones. Now let's see how this works. So that's it for today. I'll leave the selection of a specific vertex for you as homework. If you found this tutorial helpful, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.